All of the major exams to become a physician in the United States are the same kind of untrue to life multiple choice test that's taken at a computer terminal. But the intensity of the exam that I just took to become a board certified anesthesiologist, it actually makes the drama in Grey's Anatomy seem realistic for once. You'll be rated on your ability to diagnose, manage treatment, handle the unexpected, basically the strength of your constitution in crisis. In the United States, to become board certified as an anesthesiologist or a number of other specialties, you have to take what are called oral boards, which as the name implies is a verbally administered examination. But it's not just any examiner who administers the test, it's a number of board certified physicians in that specialty who take turns grilling you on topics in your field. I'm sad to say that I've watched most of Grey's Anatomy and I can assure you that the vast majority of what's in that show has been dramatized for entertainment purposes and doesn't correspond with reality. But I gotta hand it to them. The way that they portray the oral boards, it's actually pretty realistic. Handling the unexpected and quickly dealing with life or death issues is a fundamental aspect of being an anesthesiologist. And this is what they test you on the oral boards. So how do they do that exactly? The exam starts with getting some information about a given patient scenario. Any topic in anesthesiology is fair game. Despite the fact that I'm going into pediatric anesthesiology, I could be asked questions about cardiac anesthesia, OB anesthesia, pain management, critical care medicine, and so forth. The exam questions start out basically the same for all examinees. Dr. Feinstein, which preoperative labs would you like in addition to what you already see here? But where it gets tricky is the fact that subsequent questions will depend on your answer to prior questions. How does that lab change your management? The lab result will take two hours. Will you delay the case or will you proceed without it? Doctor, if you don't even need this lab to proceed to surgery, then why did you bother sticking the patient with a needle if you're not even going to wait for the result? But the dynamic format of the exam isn't even the most intimidating aspect about it. It's the psychology of the exam. The oral boards are essentially a race against the clock because the examiners have a ton of questions to rush you through, and so they'll often cut you off before you even get to the end of a given answer. What will be your anesthetic plan for this patient? I would administer general anesthesia with an endotracheal tube, and prior to that, I would place one IV in the What medications will you administer to induce anesthesia? I'd first bolus fentanyl followed by lidocaine, then propofol and rocuronium, and subsequently I would maintain the patient has an allergy to rocuronium. How will this change your approach? So if you get cut off as you're giving your answer, does that mean that you were going down the right path and they were satisfied so they just stopped asking? Or you were barking up the wrong tree so they just cut you off and moved on? How is Remy fentanyl metabolized? It's a... Uh... Should you like this video and subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying it? Yeah, that one I'm not sure about. On top of that, the examiners will routinely start down a line of inquiry and ask you questions until you get a question wrong. So no matter how smart you are, you're eventually going to get questions wrong and that's going to feel bad. For this reason, many people walk out of this exam feeling like they failed because they know that they got questions wrong, they just don't know whether they got enough correct or the right ones correct to actually pass the exam. Intuitively, you can imagine that examiners commonly pounce on uncertainty, but would you have imagined that they would also pounce on confidence? There's nothing quite as disarming as delivering your answer with confidence, only to be met by the examiner asking you, you're sure that's the best approach for this situation? In the back of your mind, you know that despite however much time you spent studying this material, the examiner sitting in front of you has been in practice for years, possibly decades. Precisely my question, Dr. Yang. I've treated this condition a dozen times. And I, a thousand times. Sometimes the examiners may try to rattle you, but picking a fight with an examiner is definitely a recipe for disaster. After all, keeping your cool in the operating room is of practical importance when things around you can get pretty stressful. Knowing that this exam is the one thing that stands between you and full board certification adds a certain level of stress to this test. My heart rate was literally 120 beats per minute as I was walking down the hall to enter the first portion of my exam. One former examiner told me a story about an examinee who had actually vomited on the table in between the examiners and the examinee during the test. A uh, 40 year old man presents with a suspicious lesion on his left temple. Sent in by his end. 
I'll reluctantly give another point to Grey's Anatomy for this one. Then to top all of this off, you have to wait three weeks in order to get your results. And let me assure you that I did not record this video during the three week waiting period because I'm superstitious enough to know that had I recorded this video during that waiting time, it would have caused me to fail. So I waited until after I got my score back, which fortunately was a passing score, and then sat down to record this video. So what happens if you fail? Well, you have to wait a year to take it again, and then you have to fly back to Raleigh, North Carolina, which is the only city in the United States where the American Board of Anesthesiology offers their oral board exam. You also have to pay the multi-thousand dollar registration fee again, and of course put yourself up in a hotel and pay your travel expenses to get there. And while the prospect of failing this exam is extremely anxiety inducing, I will remind you of one thing, which is the worst thing that can happen if you go and fail your board exam is that you have to retake it and shell out a bunch of money and go back to North Carolina. The worst thing that can happen in the hospital on any given day of being at work as an anesthesiologist is that there's a bad outcome and the patient dies. For the remainder of this video, I'll be offering my advice for anyone who is getting ready to take this exam. In terms of resources, I used the American Board of Anesthesiology old practice exams, which I thought were very realistic, but come with the drawback of not having any official published answers. I also used ultimate board prep, which I didn't find to be quite as realistic in terms of the mock exam questions, but I did find to be great in terms of content review for just reminding myself how to get through a number of different scenarios. I will say the answers and ultimate board prep were very long winded and not realistic in the sense of being able to fit all of that information into an actual answer on the exam. But like I said, it's great for content review. I also used the orange book for casual content review. It's easy to get through. I don't make any money from promoting this book, but I found it fairly useful. Obviously the most important part of getting ready for this exam is doing mock exams with anyone who's willing to do them with you. I personally think that the highest value is being able to do a mock exam with someone who is an actual board examiner because they know better than anyone how the exam actually feels. I'd also highly recommend doing mock exams with other people who are getting ready to take the oral boards. And it's especially helpful if you can study with people who are either subspecialists or are in fellowships for subspecialties so you can get very detailed answers for specific types of questions. For example, I'm currently a pediatric anesthesia fellow and my study partners were a cardiothoracic anesthesia fellow, an ICU medicine fellow, and a liver transplant anesthesia fellow. It's possible that nothing that I just suggested was new information to you, but what might be new information is the study technique that was presented to me by the director of pediatric cardiac anesthesia where I'm in fellowship, Dr. Anthony Klapsich. With his permission and attribution, I am sharing the technique that he showed me for taking a question stem and getting ready to go into your exam. Keep in mind that for the oral boards, you'll be given the question stem and then a certain period of time to simply take notes on that stem before you're even sitting in front of your examiners. So it's in your best interest to make sure that the notes that you take maximize your ability to succeed once you're actually sitting in front of the examiners. The purpose of this method is to lay out everything you already know so you're not adding any new information, but you're organizing it in a way that makes it very easy to pluck out the relevant parts once you're being asked about specific subject areas by your examiners. The Klapsich method starts by simply making a grid where at the very top your header is labeled with issue, action, and labs, as well as pre-op, intra-op, and post-op considerations. Go ahead and make your columns. And now for each issue that your patient has, you simply list a new row in your grid. So here we have a 56 year old, 70 kilo, five foot eight man brought to the operating room for a left upper lobectomy. So first we'll put left upper lobectomy and make a row for that. Next, the patient noted the onset of a productive cough six weeks ago in an episode of hemoptysis 10 days ago. He was seen by a pulmonary specialist who noted a two centimeter mass in his left upper lobe. Fiber optic bronchoscopy revealed irregularity of the left upper lobe and biopsy revealed carcinoma. So I would classify this next issue as malignancy. Moving right along, uncomplicated myocardial infarction four months ago. 
that's clearly an issue. Then we're presented with information about a stress test and an echo. There's mention of his medications, which we'll circle back to, and a history of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day for the last 25 years until 10 days ago. So I'll add that as another issue here, which is 50 pack year smoker history. Then we're presented with the physical exam, x-ray, EKG, and labs, which appear normal. So now going back and working through these issues, starting with the left upper lobectomy. So here I might put considerations about pre-op PFTs, so I can remind myself to think about how pulmonary function tests may or may not guide decision making. I may want to consider whether there's any potential mediastinal involvement that may be new since the last imaging was done, and that's at least something to think about. Given that this has the potential to be a particularly bloody case, some labs that I might think about include a type of cross, CBC, CMP, and so forth. Moving on to pre-induction considerations, I may consider this patient for regional anesthesia. And given the patient's irregularity that was noted in the left upper lobe bronchus, I might want to consider backup tubes so I can have a bronchial blocker and think about a left versus right double lumen tube. Intraoperative considerations, I might think about running Tiva versus volatile and what the risks would be for both of them. This is also a good place to think about transfusion threshold because this could be bloody and I need to know when I'm going to start transfusing blood. Moving on to the post-operative period, I have to consider whether or not this patient should go to the ICU, what I'm going to do for pain management, whether I'll swap out the double lumen tube for a single lumen tube, and so forth. I'll take this same approach to working through each one of the issues that the patient's presented with. None of the information that you write out actually ends up being new information, but it's organized in such a way that when you walk into the exam with this sheet of paper, you can reference it very easily based on the questions that the examiners are asking you. So if they hone in, for example, on the fact that this patient had a myocardial infarction, you have already thought about all of the labs that you would want, the actions you would take, your pre, intra, and post-op considerations that you can simply refer to on this sheet of paper. Of course, there are other tried and true methods for taking notes before you walk into your exam, but this is the one that I did and it worked for me. I'd recommend giving it a try. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video where I describe many of the subspecialties of anesthesiology. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.